Big news shaking the luxury fashion world, Yuke de Porte being acquired by Farfetch. Could Richemont have actually done this themselves? Is the roughly $1 billion price tag for Yuke's when they bought it for over two, two and a half billion dollars in 2018, could they have made money on this? Could they have done this deal differently? Could they have been the, the master of the fashion industry? Possibly, let's figure out how. Yuke's net a porte YNAP, as they like to call it, which was actually started by a what you know one of the biggest uh, fashion and luxury uh, and jewelry uh, conglomerates called Richemont. So Yuke's was acquired by Richemont for two point five billion euros in May of twenty eighteen. They'd gone public. Uh, in two, in 2010 and were started, man, back in 2000. So the company's been around for a long time. We have lined up Ukes versus Farfetch many, many times in the show. We've talked about the two of them um, as great examples of linear versus platform. And when you read this interview with the chairman of Richemont, Johan Rupert, and this is basically a family owned company. Chairman and founder is this guy named Johan Rupert of Richemont. Massive conglomerate, this guy's a billionaire, mega, mega billionaire. It's quoted a number of times on this deal. So they spent two and a half billion euros uh, four years ago to buy Yuxin de Porte. Linear business, not a platform business. That's why if you watch prior videos on the show, we are more bullish on Farfetch than we are on Ukes because it is so hard to get inventory in this world of luxury fashion that if you can get the supply, generally you can find the demand. And so what we've seen with the these platform models in fashion is you have all different kinds of inventory that the marketplace model can facilitate and allow people to acquire as opposed to the linear model, which is just really one, which is Here's new inventory, and now I'm going to sell it online. Whereas the marketplace model is going to let you sell used that you've had for a year, five years, 10 years, but it's a really nice item that's traditionally worth tens of thousands of dollars. And yeah, maybe someone could buy it for a few thousand dollars and it's 10 years old. So there's a whole massive market on that. Arguably, I've heard in the watch industry, the secondhand resale market for used is 10 times the size of the new market, right? So yeah, I've got a watch and this thing holds its value pretty well. Actually, in today's environment, a lot of those things have appreciated actually, and you can make money on them, selling them, um, and, but you need to get liquidity, right? These are very expensive pieces of either jewelry, uh, watch, clothing, bags, et cetera. And then there's a whole other category of inventory, which is really where you see the StockX and the goats of the world in sneakers. But actually, it's, it's technically secondhand, but it's actually still a new product. Maybe it's still in the box, but you can actually sell it for more than what it's selling for at retail because no one can actually get access to that product. There's multiple kinds of inventory that a luxury marketplace, fashion marketplace can aggregate and then provide to the consumer that just a singular e-commerce product like Yuke's Net Porte just cannot do. And so it's really interesting when you read the, some of the uh, quotes here, which I'm about to, uh, from Johan's original vision. He goes, this, this deal represents a significant step in achieving Richemont's vision of making YNAP a neutral industry-wide platform and through a put call option mechanism lays a path towards Farfetch potentially acquiring the remaining shares, bringing together these highly complementary businesses. They, he mentions, mentions this kind of neutral platform here. Last November, when Johan Rupert, chairman of Richemont, talked about partnering with Farfetch on an open and neutral platform, Rupert said that was high time that YNAP, Ukes, explored alternatives to its linear business model such as a marketplace. This guy, you know, he understands the nuance, which is very cool. How old is he? He's 72. 
There's our boy golfing in some suit and tie attire. He understands this nuance and you can see it come through in this, but it's also curious why it's taken Ukes so long to get to this marketplace vision. We knew back then that if we wish to control our destiny and protect the uniqueness of the luxury in industry as it was digitalized, we would need to collaborate as the task was too big to undertake on our own. You know, you look at this timeline. He's saying he, his date in his mind was 2015 when they set out on this journey. They then bought you Extend a Porte in, in, in 2018, linear business. 2021, Ukes and Farfetch had a partnership to start to digitalize and kind of enable some marketplace capability for Ukes. In 2020, Richemont, Farfetch, and, and, and Alibaba entered into a JV in China. So you could see these parties have been working together, 2020 doing a deal in China, 2021 doing a partnership, 2022 just saying, all right, let's get married. The luxury fashion industry is actually very consolidated. There's a handful of watch brands. Richemont owns Cartier and IWC and Vacheron Constantine, Van Cleef and Arpel, uh, Piaget, Panerai. <laughs> You know, they own multiple watch brands. They own multiple other just fashion and more kind of clothing uh, brands. And then there's the Artemis Group. They've invested in Goat. They also were a former investor in First Dibs, another sneaker marketplace. They're doing different kinds of partnerships with different kinds of uh, clothing or uh, fashion marketplaces. They did a deal with uh, Grailed, which Goat and Artemis put money into. So you can see these, you know, there are a few of these big fashion conglomerates, very often family owned or family controlled at the very least. They're getting into this world of marketplace. They kind of started out linear, but you know they knew that that's where they wanted to go. It just, it, it's very difficult when you come from control, the level of control that these brands have um, on their inventory is such a huge part of what they do. You want to try and go buy a Chanel bag, you go to Chanel's website, um, you can't do it. You have to call them. <laughs> like you say, oh, well, what's the price? I'm on Chanel's website. How much is the bag? You got to call them up. They will not give you the price. You can't buy it. And then you call them up. And they say, hey, so this is available in this boutique uh, or, or that boutique. And hey, do you want to talk to that store? <laughs> um, or if you buy something, if you buy a Chanel bag, let's say through Bergdorf, you will be in Chanel's system. They will know exactly what you bought from who, of all your information. Uh, so you see this in certain industries where the manufacturers have a lot of control. You see this in the electronic industry, right? If you make chips, semiconductor chips, there's like five or four semiconductor chip manufacturers. When those distributors sell the chips, the manufacturers know everyone. They know the whole client list. They know what you sold to who, how much, what price, what volume, all of it. So not every luxury brand can, can command that kind of power like Chanel. But the point is this, is that when you go from that way of thinking and that way of running your business, and that has what's proven success to you, these are luxury brands, and even uh, Johan talks about this discerning clientele, right? Then the idea, just the idea of marketplace is so fundamentally the exact opposite of everything that you have known how to do and how to run your traditional business. Very difficult for you to balance those two things and step right into marketplace. So I understand where they're coming from. And when you read this, they're saying, now nah, we're going to be a hybrid marketplace that is open to the entire industry. The language here is very interesting. The combination of things, these things, very interesting. Oh, and Artemis was also in the deal with Alibaba and Farfetch going into China. So you can see these recurring themes here. One, how much do they actually sell it for? Well, they get about 10% of stock in, in Farfetch for roughly a 47% stake in Ukes de Porte. So Farfetch is currently valued at about $3.5 billion. So that's call it 350 million bucks. Then there's this quarter, quarter billion dollar payment that could come in five years 
Then I think there's the other 50% and change of this, which Farfetch has uh, basically put options that they could exercise, put and call options on both sides. They could exercise so that the rest of Ukes could be acquired in totality over the next, I think, just a couple of years. So when you add that all up, maybe it's a billion dollars that Richemont would actually get in, in terms of some mixture of cash and stock in Farfetch. Interesting. Especially considering they paid two and a half billion euros, two and by the way, two and a half billion euros four years ago was probably closer to two seven, two eight billion US um, in, in terms of where the exchange rate was back then. Yeah, did they lose uh, close to $2 billion when all is said and done? Plus also not including the losses that they were funding, the CapEx that they were funding into Ukes et Porte for these past few years, which apparently have been a drag on their financials and to shareholders. So yeah, they've lost billions with a B um, on this deal. Johan though says, it was never Richemont's dream or intention to own an online business, said Rupert, arguing that Richemont originally took full control of Ukes because its former shareholders had wanted to sell their stakes. This is also very interesting. And I have been pleading for seven years to have a neutral digital sales platform that any brand could join, he added. Rupert saying Richemont is now able to do what it does best and build brand equity without worrying about running a digital business. Repositioning of Ukes from its off price to an end of cycle and circular fashion destination, that is code word for secondhand uh, goods and marketplace in a nutshell. So Rupert's saying, hey, I always wanted to have a neutral digital platform, but they never did it. Maybe they tried to do it internally. Uh, they might have actually tried to do a watch marketplace on their own. They did. They, in 2018, they also did go marketplace with WatchFinder, which is actually a secondhand marketplace for watches. But WatchFinder lags Chrono24. Looks like it was acquired for about $300 million. So they went on a buying speed. They, they, they spent nearly 3 billion, 3 billion euros in 2018. WatchFinder, really haven't heard much about them. They haven't raised any subsequent capital. Um, not really mentioned much from what the chairman wants to do, which is actually amazing that he says he's been so bullish. Maybe that's not the truth. I don't know. There's two sides, multiple sides to every story. But this is a very interesting case study. We've compared Ukes and Farfetch for many years. And now we're just kind of learning so many new facts from the chairman. If they had been able to embrace marketplace sooner, would Ukes and a Porte be worth more money? Would they be in a better, more competitive position? I think so. Would they be selling it today and getting maybe a billion dollars over the course of the next two to five years? Probably. But what seems to me actually is the management and the, the ability to activate the core business of Richemont. Richemont is so big. They have so many uh, competitive advantages and just scale and inventory. How are they able to properly leverage that and activate the core business to drastically propel forward these digital initiatives? And I think that's really where probably the biggest gap or the biggest miss has come from is you got the, seems like the chairman up here saying, yeah, let's go do this. And then it breaks down when it actually gets into the execution of it all. And what I've seen when, when, when that's the case is because this is such a huge departure from how the, the core business has operated literally for decades, and now, yeah, we want to be a neutral open platform, mm. that takes regular involvement from the chairman on a weekly basis, every other week at minimum. This guy has a lot of things going on. He's the chairman. He's not the CEO. I'm saying the chairman. There's a reason it's Johan who is talking about this deal and not the CEO of Rishmo. Because in particularly these family controlled businesses, Rishmo is publicly listed. They've got an activist shareholder in there. But if you actually look at who controls that business, it's the family. It's like Ford Motor Company. Who controls Ford? The family. Uh, yes, they have public shareholders. That's great. Yes, they have some say. But... I know who really calls the shots. 
the family. Many businesses like this, the car, the car industry basically has this just about every big car company. Uh, the fashion industry has this. A lot of industries, you'd be surprised, actually are very tightly held um, by literally just a few families. So I don't have full information here, but my question, my first question from reading this and hearing Johan and it is how involved was he? And was he really there on a regular, consistent basis over the past seven years, keeping that steady beat of the drum going and saying, hey, if we buy Ukes, we got to turn it into a marketplace, right? But, and if we want to buy Ukes, well, why would we buy Ukes if we know that we want to do marketplace? You could have bought a whole bunch of other things, which we talked about on our show. Why would you buy Ukes? Why wouldn't you buy Farfetch? When they bought Ukes, Farfetch was publicly listed and they could have bought Farfetch. No, actually, no. They could have bought Farfetch. Farfetch 2018 was worth probably about $10 billion. This deal wiped out a lot of money. I mean, Real Real was already down. Real Real is like the number two to Farfetch. I mean, they were up in the mid threes dollar, you know, 360, 337 a share. In mid-August, now they're down at 210 following the news of this deal. That, this did not help them. Yeah, they lost basically 25% of their value right when the news of this deal came out between Farfetch and Ukes. So you're seeing this consolidation happening. You're seeing platform and linear merge. You've seen also Farfetch. You've seen Farfetch invest in linear. You've seen Farfetch invest in their own proprietary brands like the Off-White brand, which they did a deal with Virgil, who fortunately passed away in the past couple of years, but they licensed that. They kind of own that off-white brand. So every, every great platform business has a natural point of becoming hybrid, except for eBay, which is why they're probably not a great platform business because they will never do linear. I don't get it. But anyway, yes, you need to do both. It's not really one or the other. It's saying, how can... How can you do platform? How can you do marketplace in this scenario and linear? We actually just talked about this on the show when we interviewed Mitch, the uh, former CEO of MoviePass. Come, he's coming out with a new book and talked about at the end of that interview in content, you have all of the content platform companies from YouTube to Twitch to Facebook and Instagram. And you have all of those that rely on user-generated content are trying to move into, as he call it, scripted content. You know, your higher production value, your, your linear content, which is what your movie studios are doing, your Netflix is doing. But why don't you see any of the movie studios, Disney, uh, Netflix, um, HBO, and now Discovery, why don't you see them trying to go in the other direction? It's always the, the platforms that are trying to do linear. Why aren't the linear trying to do platform? And Ukes was finally trying to do this in their partnership with Farfetch last year. And then they said, you know, why don't we just have the platform take over Ukes? We've got this uh, Richemont, you know, we've got this activist shareholder in here. We're funding these losses, you know, um, here, Farfetch, take it. And, um, and, you know, we're not a digital company. It's kind of reading this feedback from, from Johan here at, uh, at Rishma. I give the guy credit for trying it. Without, for, without any further information, I'd say this stuff needs to be driven top down. And with the amount of different parties and the amount of just culture and reinvention and just existing inertia of, well, this just isn't how we do things internally at the company. That to me was the biggest miss. And the way you, you get through that is it's a grind. It's just hard work, but it needs to be consistent and it needs to be driven top down. And I just don't know if Johan was there every week or at the very, at the very least every other week and just driving. Uh, him and then his team underneath him. That is my guess, but I could be wrong. If you like this video, go check out our past videos, not only comparing Ukes to Farfetch, 
covering these prior deals with Farfetch and Richemont and Artemis. But also a bunch of our videos on just secondhand kind of clothing and fashion marketplaces in general, whether we're talking about StockX um, and GOAT, or if we're talking about Etsy acquiring Depop, secondhand clothing marketplace in Europe. There's so many really great examples of this. Or Foot Locker investing $100 million into GOAT. Thanks to me. Um, go check out, we got a bunch of videos on this. It's a really interesting topic.